Welcome to War Journal, Flames of War. And this podcast is our thoughts and discussions about the Flames of War game and other related interests. This episode is brought to you by Tracy George and Chaos Magic. We are not claiming to be experts of the game, but just wanted to have a casual conversation about Flames of War. Without any further delay, we now make our advance onto the podcast. And here are your hosts, Tracy and Arthur. This is Tracy. And I'm Arthur. Welcome to War Journal Flames of War, Episode 6, Tigers in the Mud. What's on tap for today's episode, Arthur? We have five segments of interest this week. They include discussing uh, questions of the week on Battlefront's front page on Front Page News. We will visit a German warrior from our last discussion, as well as discuss the U.S. aircraft on a two-parter, Keep Your Enemies Close. In more war, we discuss the results of another one of our mid-war games. We get another lesson for Professor Sun Tzu in The Art of War. And lastly, we end with an off-topic discussion about two deck-building games. Extra, extra, read all about it. Battlefront front page news. All right, so we're going to look at Battlefront's front page. Um, I didn't see too much new that I kind of want to talk about on this one. We've got the Brown Navy. Uh, there's a pocket guide to Vietnam. There's a couple of uh, conventions coming up. They're, they're still putting their open fire boot camp mm-hmm. videos on there. Uh, there is that photo thing. I need to get that done and get in that photo contest. You should probably get that done after we finish the podcast. Yeah, I think so. I need to get that done. Uh, there's the podcast. Somebody's the Breakthrough Assault. Tell some war gamers. So it's Beyond the Foxholes. Um, I, listen video better, huh? part, I listen to a part of that. It's interesting. I need to go back and finish it. Yeah, I listen. Because you sometimes you catch things you don't know about. Um, like they uh, on their that blog, I've seen an interesting article about Panthers. He mentioned he took a Panther list to a tournament and did reasonably well. Okay, and they remind me like oh, I haven't used Panthers in a while. I might use that list or something similar to you in. A- no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the thing I think we're going to really head to is just the question of the week because we got a lot. We got four of them. Yeah. Last time there was some that weren't up. Because I made a mistake on one of them. And they made a mistake on the other. So the first one was the question number 64, which was about mixed platoons. All right, so looking at the question here, it was, uh, can I allocate all the hits to the half-tracks, basically? Yeah. We're trying to shoot the half-tracks. And I said no, and you said yes. So yes is you're free to distribute the hits. As you see fit, and the other yeah. one was no, you couldn't. Um, there was four hits, and the answer is yes. No, I got wrong on this one. Woo-hoo! Follow the hit allocation procedure leaves all teams equal. The German player is entitled to choose where the hits are placed. In armored vehicles, protection isn't quite the same as the isn't quite the same protection enjoyed by infantry or gun teams in bulletproof cover. It may be preferable not to test a good friendship in this manner, though. So I would suggest, just as a precaution, be a good pal and always remember to nominate your priority target type. Oh my gosh, I'm going in the hall of shame for this. <laughs> wow. And I think last time I was like, I thought you were right. <laughs> oh, I thought it was something about the transports normally got allocated last. I was wrong. Woo-hoo, I was right. It, I should believe in myself more. All right. So to be even more wrong for me, we're going to go to the uh, reconnaissance one. So this is uh, about reorganizing. This is number 65. And so the they pulled back yeah. from getting shot. And so they're, they're having to reorganize. So what? Recon teams. Yep. So what are they allowed to do when they're reorganizing? There was A, move, B, dig in, C, assault, D, shoot. E, conduct anti-aircraft fire, and F, take an objective. And I said they couldn't do any of it. The two you said they could do is uh, move and dig in. Okay, so going down, the correct answer is D, which is 
they can shoot. And I was talking to you on the way over here. Mm. I thought they could shoot. Mm. So, yeah, they can still shoot, but that's, that's it. So, we were still, I don't know. We were wrong. So, how many did you ask it? You said yes to A and B. That they can move and dig in. The only thing they could do out of all this list is shoot. Mm. What well, sucks, because they can't do um, defense. Is defensive fire on there? Okay, and defensive fire is not on there. I guess that would count as shooting, so. Yeah. They could still take defensive fire. But not anti-aircraft. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yep. No anti-aircraft. Okay. Well, that's a lesson learned there. Oh. And, well, like, well, I believe in myself, I do horrible. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I do well. <laughs> I was so sure I had that first one right on the explosion. Oh, I so ashamed of myself. All right, so now we got two new questions. And this one here is number 66, a clean break. This should have the answer down below. Hopefully. Should. All right, so I'm going to read what the situation is, and then we'll do the question. So a defending HMG platoon virtually overrun uh, by enemy armor. There are two choices. They can stand and wait to be destroyed or head to the rear. The table, tap, the table edge of their own deployment areas is, is within reach, so the entire platoon withdraws off the table edge. Does the platoon now need to roll a skill test after leaving the battlefield? So there's yes or no. There are no teams left to be destroyed. Now you said you were going to wait for me to do this one because you were pretty confident you this one you're confident, are you still confident? No. Other than that, <laughs> I know I'll, I'll read this, this uh, rule. Okay. But a okay, after thinking about it, I'm going to go yes. And I'm going to see what you do, and I'm going to tell you why I said yes. So what do you think? Uh, I also think yes, because I remember you can leave the battlefield, but you need to make a skill test not to be destroyed. That's it. it was like captured or something yeah. like that. If you're within so many inches, I think, of the the enemy. That's what I was going with, too, on that. No, I think it's just if you leave the battlefield, you need a skill test not to uh, what, go out of patrol. And so apparently with both of us saying yes, the obvious answer is going to be no <laughs> with how today is going. Um, answer next week. So we'll have to wait till the next podcast. So I'm going to mark that one that we need to check that one. Okay. So, and finally, number 67. All right. This one was a little confusing, so I had to set it up here, and we talked about it. And finally, we figured out how it's set up. So, a Soviet platoon of, a T6, of T-60 tanks is standing within four inches of a German Panzer Grenadier infantry platoon. There's a German AT platoon, or anti-tank platoon, consisting of three Pac-36 guns standing behind the infantry that are all facing the Soviet tanks. The infantry command team from the AT platoon is within eight inches from all the teams in the infantry platoon. The entire AT platoon is within shooting distance of the tank platoon, but more than 12 inches between the closest teams. And what they mean by the closest teams, it was the infantry yeah. platoon's teams. There was some clarification there. Can the Soviet tank platoon shoot at the AT platoon in a shooting step? and then assault the infantry platoon in the assault step. So we have A, yes it can, B, no it cannot. All right. I'm going to go yes. I will say yes. Because I think we talked about that. Can they shoot who you assault at? It's more like shoot who you can assault at. Or who's near, near who you yeah. shot at. Yeah, that's why I was never confused on this question because I thought the only important part was that the Command team was within eight inches of the infantry team. Bullseye. As soon as I read that, I'm like, I don't need to know the rest of the question. Yeah, I feel confident on this one. Yeah. You still confident on this one? I should say no, that I probably gonna get it right. All right. Oh, I wish I was 100%, but man, I can't believe it. Uh, that's all the questions this week. All right. Keep your allies close, but keep your enemies closer. All right, so this Keep Your Enemies Close is going to be a two-parter because you want to do a little bit more on uh, German Warrior, I believe you talked yeah. about last time. Uh, Otto and then, Carius. Yeah. yeah, and then I'll talk about the what I wanted to talk about. Okay. 
Um, like I said, last time when I did auto cars, what I originally had in mind, I, saw, I knew I saw him in a in a different list, mm -hmm. and I wanted to talk about both of them. However, like I thought he was in a book you own, so before the podcast, I was flipping through him and didn't see him, so I didn't bring it up. I have since like searched the website and found the PDF that I saw. So I will mention like those special rules. Okay. Like uh, is uh, called he's Autocarius Tiger Ace, and this is uh. This is he's as a in this he's a confident veteran. Oh, and which which book is this out of? It's a PDF that you can use for Gray Wolf. Oh, okay. Gray Wolf. All right. Uh, I was coming up to that because, uh, yeah, he's a confident veteran, and you can replace the Command Tiger 1E tank in a platoon from Grey Wolf, page 71, for 100 points. Okay. He has the same special rules he has in the other one, plus more. Uh, he's in a t uh, Tiger uh, tank. He's, he's found a Tiger platoon, but that platoon does not roll Tiger Age skills. He has his own special rule. Mm. And now, uh, what is interesting special rules besides the ones he had before is autos. Uh, shouldn't learn how to pronounce this. Cooper wagon. That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like a scout team. Okay. And there's a lot to it. Here's the special rule: auto carriers may either be deployed as normal as Tiger One E tank at the start of the game, or begin the game in a Cooper Wagon transfer team. While mounted in the transfer team, he's a recon. If mounted, if he's mounted in his recon uh, in the Kerber Wagon, Karius, uh platoon must be held off the table at the beginning of the game, but counts as uh, on the table platoon for the purpose of reserve rules. Oh, okay. Despite being modeled as a Kerber Wagon, Cars counts as a on-table, fully armored platoon for armored reserve rules. At the start of your turn, you may deploy the Panzer platoon held off the table so that all the platoon tanks are within six inches of its cover wagon. Uh, in addition, the Tiger 1E tanks must be more than 16 inches away from all enemy teams, concealed or entire, entirely out of line of sight of the enemy. Once deployed, Karius remounts his Tiger 1E tank and fights normally. You remove his uh, Kerber wagon. The Tigers placed on the table in this way can move and fight normally during the turn they appear. If Karius is destroyed while mounted in his Kerber wagon, the plasma platoon is immediately placed in reserves. Uh, Karius's uh, Tiger becomes a normal command Tiger 1E tank that's still used every shot counts. Even though he's been destroyed, that's all one rule. <laughs> Another rule is cars take command. Cars may uh, take company morale checks as if he was a company command team. If the command team is destroyed, if cars commands his platoon, he may reroll fill platoon morale ch checks. Okay. What a bunch of heroes. Uh, cars a plans of platoon may reroll any failed motivation test to counter attack and assaults. Every shot counts. Kind of wish he had this in the other <laughs> book. Uh, his platoon uh, rerolls any failed to hit rolls when they shoot. The platoon does? The platoon does. Wow. Uh, that's the same rule as before. And then Webling Arbor Kirshner. Uh, this is like his right hand man. You may nominate uh, one Tiger 1E tank in his platoon to be commanded by Kirstner for 50 points. In addition, while Kirstner is within command distance of Karius, Kirstner may use the sending up the shot special rule. And that's a special rule where, like, uh, you don't get concealed. Oh, yeah. Smoke him. <laughs> wow. And you hope you be on 16. Yeah. Yeah, and like, I was just kind of amazed. It's like, wow, because that is so much rules. That is. How many points is he? Uh, and here he's a hundred. Well, his whole platoon gets to reroll too. That's yeah, that's interesting. And also find out a little bit about his life. Like, I know like some of the reasons why um, 
he takes command, it's like the platoon, or not platoon, his, the company he was a part of, I think, for some reason, he kind of took over and acted as command, even though he wasn't technically the commander until later. And I kind of reading about him, I learned a lot. So uh, later on, I'm going to do a recon about him. Hmm. But something else I found interesting about him is like, you want to guess when he died? 1997. I have no idea. <laughs> From the date of this uh, podcast, he died almost three months ago. Really? Like, oh, I think I remember. Is he the one that moved to the U.S.? I don't know about that. Oh, I remember reading about some, some German guy that moved to the U.S. He died January 24th, 2015. Wow. In addition, like um, he wrote a book about his life in the war. And I think it was published, I think he wrote it in uh, 99 or 91, but it's published in two th- it's published in English in 2013, and it's called Tigers in the Mud. <laughs> and I have a copy. Awesome. And I plan on reading it and do a recon on it. Tigers in the Mud. Tigers in the Mud. The combat career of a German Panzer commander, Otto Karius. Written by Otto Karius. In his Stackpole Military History Series. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Also, some uh, about him, like, I think he was, like, a really small per- guy. He kind of uh, reminded me of, like, uh, Steve Rogers and Captain America before he became oh. Captain America. And I think he got drafted twice and got turned down. <laughs> so, I'll be reading a lot more about him yeah. because uh, he seems to be a very fascinating person. And, uh, and the thought that, like, well, I, I used his special rules like once, but that was before we played last time, and that right. like this year. That means in a World War II game, I played with a special character of a person who was still alive, and wow. didn't realize that because I didn't have not used him this year. That's interesting. So, wow. So, I definitely wanted to. Well, I found that out. I wanted to talk about him. So, yeah. some more. So, well, it's not bad to go back and do some revisions on stuff. Yeah. All right, so it's my turn. Yes, we are going to talk about the uh, AOP. I hate that thing. The Air Observation Post. The uh, reason I hate that thing is that I've been running so many lists with no AA guns. <laughs> but continue. Yeah, when I first started playing Flames of War, I didn't even look at these things. Okay. What you kept at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've learned... What they can do, and I think they're a really good value. But the problem is, in mid-war, I don't get them, which is making you happy. I'm I'll, fine I'll with that. <laughs> so one of the things is they are an indep- independent team. They're basically by themselves. But unlike other independent teams, they can't join anybody, and nobody can join them, which makes sense because they're mm-hmm. way up in the air. Um, they are treated as aircraft, so you can shoot at it. On your turn. On my turn, at the very, very, very end of my shooting step. Yeah. However, those that shoot at it can't move at the double, dig in, shoot, or assault on your turn, except for those AA machine guns with self-defense. And anybody can shoot at it. Hmm? You don't have to be, if you're in range of it, hmm. you can shoot at oh, it, okay. and it, if it's an anti-aircraft weapon. Okay. Unlike the one where you had to be underneath the template oh, of the yeah. okay. fighter intercept, or the ground attack. I see what you're talking about. Yeah can also be taken out by a fighter intercept. So mm-hmm. let's say you brought you have a ground attack aircraft or fighter intercept yeah. aircraft. You roll your dice, you get a six, you destroyed it. But mm-hmm. you don't get your aircraft that turn. It's dead. So you it's choice. Do you want to bring your ground attack? Oh, it actually, just, it actually destroys it? Yeah. It's out it, of the game. I thought it just pushed it to the side. No, it's out of the game. Once you destroy it, it's gone. Mm-hmm. It's not like the aircraft that keep, you know, you have to roll dice to get it come back. Once this is gone, it's gone. I did not know that. I thought yeah. it was just like, just push it aside and then beginning of the next turn it flies back in. Okay, so it has no weapons. It can't assault. So what good is this AOP? You got a pain in my rear. <laughs> oh, and it can't operate at night. Oh. So. I need to get the knock uh, wolf and turn it off. Of the I think it's knock yoggers like that. Yeah. The, the 900 a book. Yep. 
when I'm like, yeah, we're probably not nice. <laughs> no! Um, and unlike other aircraft, it stays on the table. Once it's put out there, it stays. Um, you can place, what's nice about it, you can put the AOP anywhere you can put an aircraft. Just not within two inches of a building, a forest, and can't be on top of linear terrain. And of course, not on top of any other model, mm -hmm. but you can put it anywhere you want. Um, so what does that get for you? Well, if you're within 16 inches and it has line of sight, you can use it as an observer. So you have stuff hidden behind a hill or hidden behind a house that my observers can't see. I could put this back behind that house and they have a clear line of sight. Now the stipulation is that who's shooting the artillery has to have a staff team. Mm. So it has to have a staff team to be able to use the aircraft. So basically this is a movable observer. So anywhere he needs to, to get rid of concealment. No movement rate, just wherever yeah. I want to put him. Like he could be at one end of the table, move eight feet, or you know, however long your table is, to the other side and use him. And if I have limited AA guns, you can always like, well, I'll put him be behind some uh, woods. It's like got to be a certain distance away from the woods for me to shoot you. Yeah. Yes, yeah, if you're shooting over. Yeah, or to, yeah if you're artillery. Um, and it does, unlike the aircraft, it can be 16 inches away. From the target. So it doesn't even have to be near the target that you're going to be bringing a shot down on. Well, I'm talking about like my AA guns. Like, because last time we used that, I had a situation, I had like guns made to kill it, but you put it behind woods. Oh, that's right. And because of the way the rules say about woods, it's like, and since it's so low to the ground, I couldn't see it. Yeah, I remember now. Um, there is that one word, if you have the staff team and you range in, if you shoot the same spot, you don't have to range in again. Oh. If he's used, he can be used for that, but he has to still see that spot. So if oh. I move him where he doesn't have line of sight to that, I don't get the, to do that. And another nice thing is, like your mortars, when they range in, they get to reroll that first one. Oh, yeah. They allow a reroll on the last attempt. So it's actually you get four mm. attempts to range in. Well, at least it's on the last one. <laughs> now, there is one other thing, and this is one thing I know you really hated. And it's a USA special rule with the AOP, and it's called column security. So if I don't use the aircraft to spot, I can place them where I think you're going to put in ambushes. And then you cannot put an ambush within 12 inches of that aircraft if it has line of sight. One thing I'm curious about, because I have some, like, some special rules that are kind of like an ambush, but they're not ambush. Yeah. So I need to find out, like, does that prevent them from behaving? Yeah, I remember those those guys you sneak up on me. Uh, yeah. Like, I hate those guys. I can't remember which. They did work well for me, but they have the potential to just be devastating. They do. Because I'd, like, move a tank over here, like, oh, these guys are coming out of the woods. Yeah. Assault. <laughs> It's like, oh, I'm always here, so he's my Pezzo Shrek's. <laughs> huh, that didn't kill you. Well, I'm going to try to assault you. Tank assault, like, four. I think, I think I know what's, I know you're even going to be next. Uh, no! <laughs> All right, so that's what I got. It's the AOP. More war! <laughs> Really? All right, so last week we played another mid-war game, and this time I had no German forces whatsoever on my list, so I actually played, oh, thank you, thank you. I actually played, uh, what, what, we were going like non, I can't even think of the word, uh, mainstream. The big ones, the big USA, ones. Germany, yeah. Britain. So what did you, I think you went with Italy again, because you're yeah. really liking Italy. Yeah, I think I'll be staying with Italy. Uh, I went with uh, Sicilian uh, Fucci Libby. <laughs> if we could speak <laughs> Italian, we'd probably be okay. Uh, they're battalion list. They're, they're, they're so big, like they call their platoons companies. And the company's battalions. Well, that's kind of like what Soviets do. Even yeah. though they're they're 
the same thing. Yeah, they're organized the same thing, except for they're in, so large. Yeah. So a company in the Soviet is actually a platoon. Yeah. A battalion is actually a company. So this is the same thing. Yeah, this is okay. the same thing. Well, I know they had a lot of men, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Because you ran, what, three platoons of these men? Three platoons of 24. Yeah. Oh, 25 them. with the command team. God. Well, yes. I first made the list of, like, I added, like, mortars to them. Well, I found out it was just cheaper if I just <laughs> grabbed the mortar team. So what what was in your list? I had... Oh, and what was this from? This is from what book? Uh, the North Africa book. Okay, the North Africa. I think I'll be sticking with the North Africa book for a while. Though I might look at sort of things that burned in parts. But that's later. Uh, HQ, there's no options there. Uh, the other thing, yeah, I had to take two company platoons, so uh, combat platoons, and but I took three, and those are like twenty-five guys each. Yeah, each, each not twenty-five total for all three. It was yeah, twenty-five in this group, twenty-five in this group, and tw so we're talking seventy about seventy-five stands. Yeah, seventy-five stands. <sighs> and then uh, also for my. Uh, Company uh, combat patrols. I had to take a machine gun team. Okay. And but I took two, so that's another eight. Man. No. Uh, and I keep forgetting the combat teams. That's five. That's another ten. Now, can they combat attach out? Uh. Yes. Oh, so they got, you could have you could have added them and make it even those platoons even bigger. That's true. Because <laughs> uh, they have they have a special rule underneath them that you could combat attach them. Yeah, I had two uh, machine gun platoons, and that's all. That's everything I had for my combat platoons. Eighty-five men. Jeez. Yeah, I saw them. Let me tell you. <laughs> and then for weapon platoons, I had two teams, uh, two three-man mortar teams with us reservers. And then for the support, I had. By, uh, I had four of the nasty tanks that, uh, only thing I've seen nasty in Italy, armor wise, the Sima Venti, that didn't do anything. Oh, uh, yeah, we'll get to that. But they were like, they had low armor, but man, they had like anti tank, what was it, 13 or something like that? 13, uh, like 30, oh, 40 inches away. That's just devastating in mid war. Yeah, it's like, Go through the list and look for uh, for Italy. And just like, well, that sucked. That sucked. That sucked. That's awesome. So they are a true definition of glass cannon. Yeah. Because <laughs> what was their front? Uh, front of like three. No, two. Two and inside and top was that zero. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, they're they're glass cannons. Anti tank thirteen. Right. You, of, yeah. And you said forty inches. Forty inches. <sighs> Wow. Yeah. Oh, and that um, armor carriers that they have their uh, transport team next to them, they have a right way to fire three. Yeah, I remember sitting, I was like, why are those sitting there? And you, then you told me about that. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Besides those, I have another five tanks that I just call crap. They were like <laughs> 105 points. I was like, these are horrible, horrible tanks. And they did far better than I th ever thought they would do. They did. <laughs> They did a lot for me. Yeah, they actually helped you win that game. Yes. Which we'll get into. And then yep. I had a air aircraft. I don't usually play with aircraft, so right. that's huge for me. I was shocked at that. Uh, it's limited. Uh, the only thing they have is like the Falco, I think. And that, yeah, that was my list. Okay. Well, I went with a finish list. Uh, it was a PDF. I cannot speak, so I'm going to mess it up, Jakari Company. So I had a command, they were SMG teams, then I had a Jakon Platoon. Um, basically a commander with six rifle teams and I made that one a, a recon platoon. Mm -hmm. And then I had another platoon, exact same thing, but they were not recon. Then I had a machine gun platoon, which I was going to combat attach out. Mm. Two of them to that non-recon. I forgot. Mm. I remember. I was like, ah, I forgot to combat attach these guys out because that may have actually helped me. Because we'll get to that about you assaulting the guys in the woods. 
if I could have had those, I might have helped. There's more men. And then I had a mortar platoon with three 81 millimeter mortars. I had three T-34s and three assault guns, which are BT-42s, which were your bane, I think. I think those were your, I think those yeah. were the ones I got you. Yeah. But, um, an anti-tank platoon with two pack uh, 38s. 50, yeah, P, actually it says PST K38. Oh, pack 38s, they are 38s. An uh, armored car platoon of two BA-10s, which were recon. A heavy mortar platoon with three M40 120mm mortars and the anti-aircraft platoon of uh, boffers. They kind of just sit in place and shoot like two of those. So that's what I had going against you, and I was actually fearless veteran in this one. Oh, uh, this was, I actually had a roll. Oh, that's right. And I was like, oh, roll horrible, roll horrible. Yeah, I wrote a six. So you there were, a six. I there think were, they were conscript, but they were fearless conscripts? Uh, fearless conscripts, yeah. Yeah, is that, ah, that, that fearless was killing me in that game because I couldn't keep anything pinned. And when you have yeah. 20, 25 men in a platoon that can, yeah. that never get pinned. They're like, I'm pinned. I'm on pin. I'm pinned. I'm on pin. Okay, so we played surrounded and you were surrounded. You oh, had to put God. all of those men in that little dinky area. That was so annoying. <laughs> but with nice things was they were in prepared positions for you. Yeah. And that, that helped save you, I think. Yeah, it did. Oh, because of the skill test? Uh, uh, I had to do firepower test to kill stuff. No, to get into prepared position. Or yeah. Get, get it. And as conscripts, that's probably wouldn't be a Yeah, it'd be five plus. So yeah, it's a good thing I started there. So, yeah. So basically, I knew that the first thing I had to take out was those anti-tank 13s because my T-34s and the uh, other uh, B, where the BT-42s. Yeah. So I had first turn. That's that's I zeroed everything in on that. Yeah, that's annoying because that's the only thing. Like, okay, this would be so fun to use, and like, well, they, it's. I shot like all the artillery, everything. I mean, that I could shoot at them. Shot at him, and you left with one. Yeah. After that, and that one did some damage, and they died. And then that was pretty much the highlight for me in that game. Because <laughs> wow, I just could. I would hit you, and yeah. then I couldn't do the firepower to take you guys out. Yeah. It. Uh, yeah, it was just like uh, you just had to cut through so many men, and I don't think you had the. Well. You probably should have charged the tanks more. Yes, I realize now. I didn't know they didn't. They had no anti-tank against those ones because I had top armor too. Yeah, and I had like I think seven on the side or something like that. What was the side on those things? They were nasty. Not the T-34s. The other ones. Wait. Uh, I guess it was the T-34s. Yeah. Because after you took out uh, my tanks, the only thing I had to really could hurt them was the aircraft. And then you also have the anti-aircraft near them, so. Yep. Yeah, I should have gone in and just started taking your, your stuff out with that. But I was afraid of, like, you. I thought you had, like, not Panzerfaust, but some other anti-tank thing. Because normally you run around with some pretty good anti-tank thing in your infantry. Yeah. Those guys are awesome. These guys. <laughs> but you get a lot of them. I get a lot yeah. of them. But and yeah. Another, yeah, and another mistake I made was I didn't use my recon to pull yeah. on the ground. Because you just hunkered down with them. Yeah, like, if I move... Yeah, because what I'm going to do, move, because, like, I can't hurt your tanks. And I could move backwards and deal with the stuff back there, but... Uh, also, you have, like, machine guns up front, and it's just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to charge machine guns. No. No. <laughs> yeah, because I was getting, what, six dice? Yeah. Time, so I was getting, like, 24 dice. And, yeah. and they would hit you... They'd pin you, but they wouldn't really kill anything because I need yeah. a six plus on firepower. And then you'd go, oh, uh, two plus. Okay, I'm all right. I'm not yeah. pinned anymore. Well, three plus. So they were three? Yeah. Um, oh, fearless, yeah. Fearless, yeah. It's only two plus if you kill a commander. Which and I, then I make a... I don't think I... Did I even take out a platoon? No. I don't think I did. Unless of that, that anti-tank 13 group. Oh, yeah, you took that out. Uh, yeah, I think I... Either I forgot the roll, or I 
think I forgot either forgot the ro role or, or the commander died in a certain way that didn't count. Yeah. yeah, it was a pain. Well, the game came down to I was coming in both sides, and I had one side I didn't reinforce as well yeah. as I should have. And I had you took out the recon guys from that side. And then I had another platoon of men, and I yeah. had mortars on that side. Yeah. And most of that just got taken out by, by crappy tanks. And I'm like, yeah, these guys suck. And he's like, oh, well, they charged. They kind of eventually took out this unit. I watched this unit, took that out. Well, I guess I really can't call them crappy anymore. Yeah, and I had, the, what, I had that one platoon of uh, men. Let's see, that was the Jacon platoon, which is one commander. Six rival teams, and they were hiding in the woods. Right. So you had to come within six. And the sad thing was, I actually took out some of your tanks. Yeah. One one got bailed out, and you couldn't get it back in. Yeah, he did. So get you it came back. in with like three tanks. Yeah. And you shot, but you weren't. Somehow you couldn't assault or something. And so it was my turn, and you were close enough that I can assault you out of the woods. So you did not get defensive fire. Yeah. And I missed. I think I've missed totally with everything. Uh, it's like, oh my gosh! So you come back a wipe. <laughs> oh, okay, back and came back. I hurt you a little bit. Then you destroyed one more thing, and then you forced me back, and then you ran back into the woods. But at that point, you were no longer dug in and got the ground. Right. At that point, I was like, I remember my star trooper move. That's better. <laughs> and and which means like the. Platoon of twenty five guys that haven't moved. It's like, well, you're within uh, five or six. Uh, you're within fourteen inches of them, of like ten guys. So, yeah, this unit is gonna charge. Yeah, you did. What was that rule called for Italy? Uh, Avati. Okay, that wasn't that rule. I thought it was, yeah. I was missing. Yeah, yeah so in the shooting, no, the movement. You moved. Move. Then in shooting step, you. Mm -hmm. You successful on that? Do a skill test, yeah. Which is a three plus for them because uh, it's a. Uh, uh, you made it, whatever it was. Yeah, I made it. And then you assaulted four. Yeah. So if I'm within fourteen inches, I was in trouble, and I only had what three guys left, I think, out of that, or yeah. four. So it's like I'm not going to pin you. <laughs> yeah, they also moved the takes back in, so it's like you so. And that was pretty much game. Yeah. Oh yeah, because your the closest take. Because you have to be within 16 of both objectives, and your closest take to move was more than six more. It was more than 16 from the maximum speed to get to the objective. Right. So. Yeah, I was one inch. I think one yeah. inch away. Yeah. So that was, gosh, just having that many men dug in and gone to ground, and it, it was so hard. But I did like the list. I think I, I can live with that list. It's just yeah. I would have to fight you differently. Yeah. I'm gonna have to use my recon pull. Yes. And then just start just putting artillery down and just take out one platoon at a time. Like the other thing about, about this list I just realized is like at one point I thought about like eventually going to tournaments and you realize you compare this list to Soviets a lot. And so if you ever go to a tournament, you probably get a chance we're gonna be fighting something like this. Just so is a Soviet player. So we need to learn how to deal with large platoons. Recon? And artillery, because you have to have that firepower. And, yeah. But I did get you on that one with the breakthrough guns. You were kind yeah. of shocked on that because the BTs, forty twos, where they got the straight shot. And so I hit, and it's like, all right, I hit a couple times, and you were getting ready to roll your saves. Oh, you don't get saved. You're like, what? <laughs> it's breakthrough guns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but also flamethrowers. Flamethrowers are another way. Like if you have, yeah. Ooh, yeah. If you get a flamethrower tank. Yeah, like uh, last game I had like a flamethrower that could use it, but that's still like six shots. Skill test. Doesn't have any of your, your guys die. Yep. Well, I got that new book, uh, Burning Empire, so we'll see what we can do with that. Yeah. We need a couple of ways to break through like 85 guys. <laughs> High firepower. Soldier, you will shape up and you will listen, because we are now going to talk about Sun Tzu and the art of war. Attention! All right, time for some Sun Tzu. So we're going to continue. I think, yeah, we're in a terrain section still. 
and we're going through some of the different terrains. So now we're at number eight. And it says, with regard to narrow passes, if you can occupy them first, let them be strongly garrisoned and await the advent of the enemy. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. Kind of like, what was that, uh, 300? Oh. Where they channeled that big army into a yeah. small area so it's easier to defend a yeah, smaller so, amount of people. Uh, that worked because they had such a easily defended spot and the big army couldn't flank them. Right. It's still impressive. So, yeah, the basic idea is like, uh, yeah, if there's a narrow pass, you want to get there first, garrison, it, so it'll be a nightmare for the enemy to take it. No, I guess that could be like going between two different terrain features. Yeah. And the guy's like, ooh, I don't want to do bogging checks or anything you know, like that. You don't do a bogging check or like if you have to go in here, it's like, like if they're like two uh, a street and two buildings or four buildings and the buildings are filled with infantry, you're like, huh, I, I want to get here to get to the uh, objective. But he has so many infantry there, they're going to take so many shots at me. Yeah. All right, so nine... Should the enemy forestall you in occupying a pass, do not go after him if the pass is fully garrisoned, but only if it is weakly garrisoned. Yeah. Flip side is like, if you look at that path, you're just like, nope. Yep. <laughs> Find a different route. Find a different route. Or try to uh, do anti uh, artillery to force them out. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to move to a different type of terrain. It says 10. With regard to precipitous heights, if you are if you are beforehand with your adversary, you should occupy the raised and sunny spots and there wait for him to come up. Now in Planes of War, I don't think that really matters too much about assaulting or coming up onto a high ground. The one thing I, I did uh, notice is like if there's a hill and you got your tanks and you got um, hold, hold down. down, it's like it's a lot harder to uh, go up it. Oh, that's true. Yeah. So that's one thing. Like, oh, that matters. Yep. Because that's that's been enough. You're like battles where I have to go uphill. It's like you got that extra bonus to, for me to hit you, and you you just freely fire, shoot back at me. Yep. Okay, number eleven. If the enemy has occupied them before you, do not follow him, but retreat and try to entice him away. Still not sure about that in Flames of War. Yeah, it, it depends. It's like uh, using the same scenario. If your your opponent got the ball, uh, the keep on say ball down, build out, but like hull down. It's like uh, depending on what you have. I usually have a lot of monsters that just like I just go go up up it and just take the fire power. I probably survive. If I'm not having a lift with that. I pr it's probably not a good idea to charge uphill against the tanks. So I'm better off trying to move around to force you to move. It's to flank you so you don't have to... Or, you know what, you guys, you can artillery them and then you're ranged in on that spot and you're just oh, going to yeah. keep pounding that spot. So you, you better get out of there. Or smoke. Like, you smoke there like you can't see now. Right. Now you, like, need to move to if you want to shoot me. Yep. All right, number 12. If you are situated at a great distance from the enemy and the strength of the two armies is equal, it is not easy to provoke a battle and fighting will be to your disadvantage. Now, what I got kind of like my notes here, mm -hmm. they were talking about you're, you're so worn out from the long march getting up there that the enemy is ready for you and they're fresh. But in Flames of War, if you think about it, if you're having to march across the battlefield, you're just being shot, shot, shot. Yeah. Some of your stuff's not going to be able to shoot because you can't do artillery if you're moving. And... Or if you move up the double, then it's like yep. they, you try to get over there, then you just open yourself up to pain. So I guess if the objective's not a problem for you in that part of the game, make the enemy make yeah. the long distance trek to you so you can start, you know, because you can be dug in and gone to ground, or yeah. not gone to ground, but you can be dug in. And they're having to march their stuff across there, and they're not dug in. So. Yeah. So, so hey. that fits Finns of War, War a fair amount. Yep. So next time it's going to be 13, which is a whole new section that has to do with Earth. We'll Six principles that. connected with Earth. Yep. Hmm. All right. 
So there was some good stuff in this one. I guess one another thing is, I guess uh, what I'm getting from this is patience. Yes. Don't rush. And now for something completely off topic. All right, Arthur. So, well, for me, it was two new games. I don't know about maybe one of them's not new for you. Well, they're both new because like okay. I, I started playing it like three days before you did. Oh, okay. <laughs> So one of them was uh, I finally decided to get the Legendary Encounters, which was the Alien deck building game, which is based off the legacy superhero, Marvel superhero. Legendary superhero. And somebody told me it was a lot more cooperative. I kind of like Legendary, I'll play it, but I'm not too excited about it now, as I used to be. Yeah, like a big problem with uh, the Marvel one, mm -hmm. it just seems like you needed a app to figure out what's the proper way to set up a scenario. Because it's like, if you don't do the scenarios correctly, it's like, just doesn't make sense. Or, you got problems. Yep, so, so going into this, I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to pay the money for this game. I hardly buy any. I research these games before I buy them now, because mm -hmm. I used to get hosed. Mm -hmm. And said, so, okay. And I trusted the guy that said about it, and I told him what my problems was, and he says, you probably really will like it. So, one of the neat things about this game is you can actually play the movies in the game. Yeah. So we played the Alien, the first movie, Alien Ripley, you know, and the, the, yeah. I can't remember, Nostromo. I've never seen the movie. Okay. So we played that scenario, and it actually... It kind of fit. Yeah, and it, it felt like a horror movie, even though I've never seen the movie. It still got that feel, uh, similar feeling. And it was kind of like the first thing mission was the SOS. Yeah. So you had to get the SOS message. So that's like going to that ship where the egg was at. Yeah. And then it was trapping it in the airlock, the alien. That was your second objective. So you actually had missions compared to, I want to say, like the Marvel one. Just, just, you're just battling the bad guy. You just battle just, the bad guy, and sometimes he does something to hurt the party. Right. This actually, you could see, I could see the movie happening in this yeah. game. And the last one was you're trying to, I think, blast them out of the airlock. Yeah. That was the last thing. Yeah. And you actually have the characters in the game. So we had Warrant Officer Ripley. You had Captain Dallas, Chief Engineer Parker, and Navigator Lambert. That was actually in the game. And you used their cards to do stuff. Yeah. It, I really enjoyed it. it. It felt more balanced. It felt a little more of a threat, even though the first mission was fairly easy. Yeah, that's the thing that throws me is we played that mission. I was like, well, this, this was fun, but it was, I didn't. Yeah. There was a couple times, you know, but normally, but for the most part, I felt like, yeah, we did this pretty good. And you read the reviews, like, this is a hard game. I'm like, did we, we didn't do anything wrong because, I mean, yeah. I looked at the rules. No, we follow the rules. <laughs> First of all, it, it can help you if you get like an egg, you have a string of like no damage. Oh, that's true, yes. Then it's like, ooh, that's so then, that's rough. And the reason that's rough is, like, if you don't destroy an egg, if it becomes in front of you, you don't destroy an egg for your next uh, turn. The face hugger. I think it's right. The face hugger, if you get a face hugger. Oh, yeah. It's a face hugger. Oh, no, yeah. It's, a, it's an egg. If it goes to a combat area, it's, des it's destroyed, and then you put a face hugger in front of you. And for the next turn, if that's not killed at the end of your next turn, you get a chest burster in your deck. And if you draw that card, you die. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and another difference was that um, the other one you took like wounds or something like that and oh, you added them to your deck, you would your draw hand. them. And it just this, screwed you up. This one, your guys had hit points and you just put those wounds right next to them so you could count up your hit points so it didn't mess up your deck. Yeah. And also, one of the nice things I thought was nice about this, each of you have a uh, you're like you're a class ability. Yeah, class. That's it. It's like you'd be a gunner, a commander, a medic, and each of them have a special ability card. Okay. Yep. But the thing was, you didn't have that all the time. Normally, like I'm used mm -hmm. to having games where it's in front of you and like Pandemic oh, or yeah. Defenders of Realm, you always get to do that ability. This one, you only got to do it when you drew it into your hand. It's like, woohoo, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I was screwed up the second time. I'm like, yeah, I scanned that room. Oh, wait, I don't have the card. <laughs> So we played yesterday, we played the Aliens, so we've gone to the second movie now. 
And this one was, there was the lost colony, which I think we had to kill the infected people. Is oh, yeah, we had th three uh, colonists. Then they mostly come at night where we had to set up the two guns, which got cut out of the original movie. Some people may not know that was originally in the movie. They set mm. up these big guns in a hallway yeah. that shoot things that come at them. You didn't want to see them shoot. You just heard the guns just shoot, and you see the, the like, thousand bullets just cut down, like, okay, 900. 800, <laughs> 700, 600. I'm like, okay, they're empty. And then finally, uh, who's laying the eggs? And that's where the queen would pop up and you had to kill the queen. And again, in this one, except for just a couple of times, it was hard at the beginning because we got slammed. But once we set up those guns, it made it so much easier. Yeah. We we'll have to check see if we keep the guns out, but it didn't say you take them off. Yeah. Like it said, in a lot of objectives take this off. Yeah. It didn't say take the guns off. So, yeah, like it did for the first part of visibility, it make it harder to scan stuff. Like in there, it says like we move the objective, remove these. Oh yeah, that was another rule. Was the scanning was different. Oh, yeah. That in like uh, in Marvel, like we get a new card, you flip it over so you see what you're dealing with. And here, or face down. And you have to scan it to make it face up, and, and then you could deal with it. You had to use. You actually have to use some of your fight cards to scan. So it isn't like oh, I just scan it. No, what you use to scan, you're actually weakening yourself to attack the aliens. Yeah. And but the closer they are to dropping down into the very bad zone, the combat zone, which is another new thing, uh, it was easier to scan for them. So it was like a two, two, three, yeah. three, four, or something like that to scan as you went for yeah. it. Yeah, and Marvel's they. Go to that combat zone. They sit pretty much out the gate, and then they do something that hurts the party, and that's it. Whereas they really only hurt you when they get there. Yeah, yeah. And some of the aliens, like uh, legendaries, you fight them, you take this damage. And aliens, a lot of them, if you just kill the aliens, nothing happens to you. But if they get down to that combat zone, at the end of your turn, how many ever aliens, unless it says otherwise, I think yeah. like the egg was one. Yeah, or the egg is the only one. Doesn't do anything. But if you have like three aliens down there, you're drawing these strike cards. Yeah. That's... And it isn't like that wound deal. Yeah. The each card has like a different amount. Some of them's like nothing, it's just a flesh or just doesn't hurt you. Others, it's like one damage, draw another card, and three damage, and then five. And when you only have like nine to ten hit points, a couple of those. Yeah, that's scary. So yeah, you have to take care of those guys in the combat zone. So at the end of your turn, you're not being hit. But then you have all this stuff coming at you. But then you don't know if, like, the guns we had to find yeah. were some of the hidden cards that were moving along. So yeah. you, you want to reveal them so you can find these so you get done with that objective. Because if you don't get done with the objective and these event cards pop up, it's yeah. not very much fun. But yeah, I think they, that game very much captured the feeling of yeah. the movies, at least the first two so far. Now, have you seen the second movie, The Aliens? Yes, I've okay. seen Aliens so, a lot. So this one, you can, the second game we played, you can actually compare it to how the movie was. Yeah. And so, what do you think? It fit fairly well. Like, uh, well, I realized, like, oh, we're here, we're further down in the movie than I thought, but I was like, okay, yeah, I can, I can see that now. And then, okay, yeah, I remember that part, so yeah, we need to do that, we need to do that. So, yeah, I actually... I think it, it fit the movie really, really well. And I'm very proud of ourselves. There's one thing we didn't do too much of. Game over, man. Game over. Why don't we just put her in charge? We didn't have too much of that, but you know yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> we made him sound more like the badass. It's like, yeah, well, like, when he's fighting the aliens, he was pretty epic. Where they're not fighting the aliens and just waiting for them to come, he's kind of a fancy. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, oh, you want some? You want some too? Oh, you? Oh, I got some for you. So when it came down to fighting, he was there, it was but it was just the beforehand. He was really. <laughs> All right, so what was, you You brought over another game for yeah. us to play. Another game is uh, Shadowrun Crossfire. Uh, I uh, played it like, when I first played it, I really liked it, and then two days later, I bought it. Uh-huh. Uh, -huh. uh I should have because money concerns, but it's a game I like. Yeah, I guess you never pl uh, played Shadowrun before. No, it wasn't my genre. So, like, uh, Sh Shadowrun, uh, I need to explain what the setting is like. Well, it started out to be the future of the 80s. Like, 
at some p- certain point, magic came back into the world where there's elves, goblins, mm-hmm. not goblins, elves, or there might be goblins, but the main races are elves, dwarves, trolls, and orcs. Oh, and humans. Well, <laughs> it's Earth. <laughs> the uh, thing is, like with the f- uh, there's a event called goblinization where people just turn into either trolls or oh. orcs, and just all of a sudden they just transform. And at the same time, or maybe it was a different event, uh, some new uh, kids being born would be born as elves and dwarfs. And the races have different, like, that uh, requirements. Like, elves are really charismatic and agility. Trolls are huge with horns Mm -hmm. and can take a lot of damage and that kind of stuff. And the big thing about Shadowrun is like is a setting where it has future technology like guns, lasers, all that stuff, the internet, as well as magic. There's dragons in the setting, which are nasty. <laughs> like, there's like a set. Uh, there's a saying in the setting about never make a deal or do a deal with a dragon. Hmm. And they're such a powerful beings. Uh, but the big thing is like corporations are co- mostly running everything, and but sometimes like it uh, one thing's done, but it doesn't want to be connected to them. So that's where shadow runs come in. They uh, they're uh, was it plausibility possible deniability po- possible deniability they're expendable. So if they do the job excellent. If not. You have no idea who they are, <laughs> and that's what the setting is. And the big thing about setting uh, the setting is like it's pretty brutal. In fourth edition, the, in the the intro story, they get you used to the setting. Out of the five runners, I think two died. Wow. So it's a pretty brutal setting. Okay, so this is another kind of deck building game, but it's, it's different. Yeah, it's different. It is another deck building game. Like, it's interesting, it has uh, races, where the five main races, and that affects your hand, your starting hand, uh, your starting hit points, and your starting money. That's another thing about this game, is like, unlike other deck building games, there's no resource card. You just, it's separate tokens that you use right. to buy stuff, which is interesting to me. But you ha- have classes, and the classes are basically like uh, that's red cards, blue cards, black cards, and green cards. And each class has four of their own color and one of each, one of the others. Right. So in theory, everyone can do anything they want. But so like I was the elf wizard, so I got four of the mana cards and then yeah. one of the other classes cards. Yes. Yeah. And how you play? Well. Each, there are various types of missions to tell you how to play, but usually there's uh, a mission that tells you, the default mission is you uh, get an obstacle for every player in the game. And obstacles are pretty much bad guys you need to d- be dealt with. Mm-hmm. And you play them, pull them off, they put them in front of players, and on your turn, you can play cards, apply the damage, if there's any guy still in front of you, you take damage, and then you draw and to buy more cards. And <clears throat> every obstacle you kill, you can the party gets money, so you can buy more. Yeah, and another thing I saw was you could play on other people's obstacle to help them. Yes, it, like yeah, you don't have to just deal with the one in front of you. You can deal with other people. And in fact, if you're like the troll with a lot of hit points, you're probably better off dealing with other people's because you can take the hits. And the obstacle that's in front of you at the end of your turn, it tells you how much damage you would mm-hmm. take. And it's kind of like the the aliens one, where you only have so many hit points. Yes. And uh, so one of the things was is like to take care of, like, say I had this objective in front of me, it would have a lightning bolt, a circle with a three, and then a gun and a mask. And it's kind of like suits. Yes. <clears throat> so it could be like a heart, three of any card, a diamond, and then a club. Yes. And when it has a uh, symbol, 
you need that symbol to dis destroy that uh, section of the card. If it's just a number, you just need to play, it's colorless. Mm -hmm. Right. From using a Magic the Gathering term, you can use any color if you just need that much. And once you clear all of it, uh, it dies and then uh, everyone gets money. And on top of that, there's a, a deck called the Crossfire deck, which plays one every turn. At the beginning of every t turn, and everyone gets the, uh, gets the play. And most of those are rough for the party. Oh, they are. They're, they're bad. And then after, uh, <clears throat> once all the obstacles are dealt with, the current uh, crossfire goes to the bottom of the deck. So you, which is good, because if it gets discarded, that uh, creates a pool that makes other stuff nastier. Because I did see, like, you were reading one, and if there was five crossfires in the discard pile, yeah. there's really, really bad stuff yeah. happens. Yeah. We only have four. We don't have this happening. Yeah, it's like, it's like, yeah, you can only play three cards. If there's five in the crossfire, everyone can only play one card. Yeah, there was one thing, too. It was, you play as many cards as you want, and then they kind of stay out there, and then what you don't use, I'm used to, you discard everything and you yeah. draw back up. What you don't use stays in front of you. Yes. And then if, after you're doing all that, I think then if you have three or less cards, you get to draw two cards. You get to draw two cards. And then you, you get the buy. buy. But those buys... Goes in your hand, not in your discard. Like that, was another th that was another thing that got me, because I kept wanting to throw it in my discard pile. Yeah. And you're like, no, 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 it goes in front of you. Oh! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not that we kind of describe the game. There's another element about it, like, I need to say. It's a hard game. Oh, yeah. I, it's it's brutal. It is. Because the first game we played, we played two. Yeah. So the first game we played, all of us died. Yeah, yeah. Because all those, we didn't get any of those objectives taken care of, and then they just start swarming on one person. When one person goes down to what's called critical, yeah. everybody has to leave. The game. Yeah, everyone has to leave. So you're getting one last turn to try to escape, but all those objectives are coming towards you, and you can't take them all out, and then you're suddenly getting hit with Four yeah. or five damage. You only have, you know, that's all. You only had three hit points left yeah. to begin with. Yeah, it's it's a difference. Like I'm used to, like most cooperative games I played, I feel like by default, it's like new people picking up the game for the first time has a prior reasonably good chance of winning. And if the more you play it, the more experience you get, and then you usually some of them have options on how to make it harder. Right. Yeah. Shadowrun. It's like, it's, it's default is, prior other games, extreme hard. No, this, this is the way I picture this game. Okay, you get the box, you open it up, and it just starts slapping you around. Before you even start the game, it's slapping you around. It's like, <laughs> it's a game, Shadow is like, if you're like new players, like, don't really know how it feels, like, you have no chance of winning. You're just gonna, you're just yeah. gonna die. If you keep up with it and play and learn and keep learning, the game becomes beatable. I, I played a game this morning by myself where I played all four decks. I did make one small error by one. Wow. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, I won. And, and I think it's, it's all about like you need to be very efficient with your moves. You need to do things quickly, and you need to target priorities uh, properly. Yeah, because the second game we played. We, one of one of our players escaped alive, so we kind of yeah. got something like a tie or something on that one. Yeah, we uh, successfully boarded the mission, and it was a campaign game, which we'll talk about later. Everyone got one karma. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think the difficulty of the game fits the setting. The setting is brutal, and this game is, they specifically made it to be brutal. Oh, it is. Very I think if people put the time to learn how to play the game, I think your success rate is probably be more than 50%. And, but you still, like I said, some of the crossfire cards are really bad and can just ruin any kind of plans, which also kind of fits with the setting, which hmm. like, we have a perfectly laid plan, just, we're going to do this, we're going to this, 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 and then we're going to grab the stuff and leave. And then when you're in the middle of your run, 
Something new happens that you didn't know about, and then all your plans go out the window. <laughs> so you got to learn how to adapt. And I think they put that aspect into the board game. The other thing I like about the game is it has a campaign mode, uh-huh. in which case it's like, after you play a mission, if if it's successful or successfully aborted, you get karma. And then after, you can spend karma to buy upgrades. Um, the thing is, they also made the game because they want to make sure this game is as brutal as possible. How much XP you have affects uh, the karma rewards because you have a, a lot of karma, it lowers the rewards. Oh. And you also have options to make the game more difficult. Say like, <laughs> say like, <laughs> I laugh at that because <laughs> after my experience with it. <laughs> well, if you do that, you get more karma. So it's not just like I want to make it harder for no reason. It's like. Yeah, if you do this, the game is harder, but you're going to get more karma. Wow. And when, while most of the missions, the karma rewards is in the three to four range, plus one or plus two karma is a lot. Hmm. Yeah. I just can't picture making it harder. Well, I think at first you need to probably get better at the game. Because I know a lot hey, of other hey, people... what are you trying to say? What are you trying to say here? Oh, no. <laughs> you're new to the game. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, because I, like, I was the wizard, and I decided, I'm just going to buy blue cards... And that game, okay, there was three blue cards at the very beginning, and the yeah. first crossfire said get rid of all blue cards or something yeah. like that. And one came up the whole game, and I was taken out. Yeah, that's the type of game. Uh, you you kind of want to save up to get stuff you like, but you can't wait too long. Yeah, I had like 12, I think I had 12, well, each token's a million. I had 12 yeah. million to buy Spells and it just never no came new yen. It's just oh new whatever they're called the, the it's the, a dollar. I think it, it combines something with yen, uh, yen like new yen. Okay, like the Japanese. Well, currency. I had a lot of it, but I did not get to spend. Oh, I did spend it on the healing one, which is kind of too late. Yeah. I think <laughs> and people in general says like um, you need to focus more on doing damage than healing. It's like the thing about the game I played this morning that one. I wasn't sure I was going to win because uh, on the last turn, the last event, it was like six op- uh, obstacles. Three of them was hard. That's the other thing. There's normal obstacles and hard obstacles. Mm-hmm. And the more uh, when you set up the obstacles, how many uh, crossfires you have in the discard tells you how many hard you have, which are mm-hmm. either a lot harder or decently hard for very little reward. Put, put now seeing all the the obstacles, I realized like uh, beforehand, I, like most of my guys had like a decent hand, and I needed quickly to like okay with a lot of good, decent cards, blow that up, blow up, blow that up before they could do much. Well, I have to try it again, and I'll die again. But I will buy another blue card before I die. <laughs> Well, that wraps up another episode of War Journal, Flames of War. Your hosts, Arthur and Tracy, thank you for listening to this episode. You can find us on iTunes. If you like the episode, please subscribe and leave a positive review. You can find us on Facebook at Flames of War. And please like us. In addition, you can follow us on Twitter at WarJournal underscore F-O-W. You can also find us on YouTube. Search for Tracy George, Flames of War. You can read Arthur's blog at chaosmagicwizards.blogspot.com. Finally, you can email us at warjournalflamesofwar at gmail.com. War Journal Flames of War is all one word, so no spaces are required. Also, please share the show on any social media of your choice. So, until next time, as always, have a good game.